Good morning, everyone, or perhaps it's good afternoon or good night, uh, depending on what time you're watching this video. It's nice not to be up at 8 a.m. this week, isn't it? Um, our classes this week are over YouTube uh, because I'm traveling for work. Um, uh, a link to our YouTube videos will be on our class uh, uh, schedule in the week two folder. Uh, also on our, our class schedule under week two on our syllabus as well. So the links to the this video will be right here. Uh, the link to Thursday's video will be right here. And they'll also appear, uh, you know, accordingly uh, on your, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, <laughs> on your uh, uh, syllabus as well. Um, so today uh, we're going to jump in here uh, and uh, handle some housekeeping stuff, just wrapping up Twitter and Medium account setup stuff. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to go over a lecture on uh, data journalism basics, get a nice good fundamental base under you before we start pulling data next week, analyzing data in week four, and then we start building graphics week five, week six. So, you know, data journalism is a process and we're going to kind of cover that big picture process today. Um, reading's pretty light. Our World in Data, which is a uh, great uh, uh, database of uh, uh, data from around the world, has a good article about the importance of global data. Read that. It'll help set up next week really, really well uh, because you're going to start pulling data sets locally and from all over the world um, and finding them and trying to kind of find a story in them. So this article sets it up really well. Um, in pages 20 to 30 uh, in uh, the Data Journalism Best uh, Practices PDF. It's in the week two folder. And again, it kind of sets up the semester quite nicely. Um, our reading Thursday, we got chapters one and three in the Data Plus Journalism textbook. Um, it really gets into finding data and reporting with data, uh, which is what we're going to do next week, start, start pulling data sets. Uh, and then read the uh, Digging for Data handout in the week three folder. It'll get you ready for what we're going to do. A couple of very short reads in the free data journalism handbook uh, down here. Um, and then you're set to go. So, you know, pretty light reading. You know, those chapters are very, very short. Um, so um, last call. Uh, you need to add a one to two sentence bio photo and link to both your Medium and your Twitter accounts. And I'll kind of show you what that looks like. On Medium, uh, you can click on Edit Profile and you can go in and upload a photo and just write a couple of sentences describing, you know, who you are and what what you do. You know, uh, if you're interning somewhere, you know, uh, UIC Com Senior, you know, whatever you want to use to describe yourself. But it's important to have an identity with your your posts on on Medium. Uh, and when you're done, you know, you'll have several, uh, you know, different assignments that are in here. It's a nice portfolio when you get done. It's not just going to be your map grants uh, story uh, that's up there. You're going to have your own work, graphics and, and final project, all kinds of cool things. So you want to have this identity up here. Plus, it helps people find you. Also, make sure you go through and follow everybody uh, in class. Uh, and you can do that on our uh, Medium and Twitter accounts handout. You guys will have all your uh, names and, and email or names and uh, Medium and Twitter links in here, which you did last week. You can just click on Medium and follow people. It's got a little green follow button in the upper right. And Twitter, of course, or X as they call it now, uh, you will uh, you know how to hit follow on there. So uh, you can just go down the line by next week and make sure you're following everybody. And make sure if you, it's not already on here uh, from last week that your name at Medium and Twitter uh, uh, account links are are up here. Uh, in Twitter, um, you want to have uh, your bio. Uh, you can click edit profile. Uh, make sure your name is here. Uh, whatever your handle was, it will appear here. Uh, a short bio on who you are, maybe a couple of sentences. Uh, a link to your uh, Medium account right here. It allows you a little field to uh, enter your link, uh, your location. You know, you can put your hometown too if you don't want to do Chicago. Uh, you know, uh, I put my job in there, education. Your, your birthday is optional. You don't have to put your birth date in there. Um, but, you know, just a sentence or two to identify who you are. Make sure you have a picture of yourself or some type of emoji in there. Uh, you can do all this by hitting uh, uh, the uh, uh, edit profile button up here. Uh, you can add your image, um, add your bio information, location, website. Um, and again, if you're already linking like to your Instagram account, if this is an existing Twitter account, that's fine too. But if not, at least have something in there. Uh, if not your LinkedIn account or your uh, medium for this class, whatever, and enter uh, your birth date, and that's optional. Uh, you don't have to do that. So, um, but anyway, uh, you know, make sure you've got all that stuff uh, set up. 
uh, by next week. Because I do look at these profiles uh, and, and it will count against your grade if, if you don't have the, the profile set up properly. Um, it's really important. It's one of the things my boss has asked me to do with this class is to make sure you guys have professional social media presence. Uh, and we'll work with LinkedIn and some other tools a little later in the semester. Um, but make sure that you have that professional profile. Also, make sure you're following me on Twitter at It's Mike Riley and at Jordan Toolbox. Make sure you're following both of those accounts. Uh, they're on the syllabus. Those links are. Uh, and also that you're following our Substack. Uh, this is a free newsletter. Uh, it'll ask you if you want to donate. You don't have to donate any money to the newsletter. Uh, you get the same thing, whether it's free or it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, not. Um, and uh, subscribe to this. Uh, it's a newsletter I put out from Journalist Toolbox every uh, two weeks, uh, every other Tuesday around 8 a.m., right, right as our class is starting, it comes out. Um, and it focuses on, you know, a new tool for journalists. Um, you know, a lot of them are data tools. Some of them are AI-driven. Uh, usually has a training video built into it. You know, some other tools uh, down here and, you know, and some other things. You know, it's about a five-minute read. Uh, but it keeps you up to speed on what's going on in the industry and the new tools that are available to us uh, as journalists. And they also, many of them help you as a student, too. So they make you more efficient. So anyway, uh, make sure that you've done all this uh, by the start of next week's class. Really, it's your only homework along with the reading. There's no assignments this week. But just make sure you get all this stuff done because I do check and make sure you're subscribing to the newsletter, following me on Twitter and, and all that stuff. So uh, make sure you get that done. All right, the lecture for today, uh, the fundamentals of data journalism, data journalism basics. It's kind of a fun one. It's got a lot of graphics and stuff in it. And uh, I've done this lecture for years and I keep updating and adding to it as we get more things, more factors in uh, you know, data journalism, more techniques, more software, uh, things like that. So, you know, I up to date this class after every semester with new things and sometimes even during class as well. I'll show you a new tool that comes out or something like that. But now we just want to lay the nice foundation for, you know, understanding what data journalism is and what journalism is as a whole. Uh, because journalism is about truth telling, you know, that's the mission. And, you know, sometimes journalists mess that up, they'll get something wrong. Uh, and our obligation then is to run a correction and correct it so our readers know that we made a mistake apologize for the error, and then move on. Don't make it again. Don't make the same mistake twice. Uh, this is a uh, quote that used to open up an old TV show called Numbers. It used to run on CBS, uh, you know, uh, up till a few years ago. And it was an okay show, but I really like this opening statement from it. We all use math every day to predict the weather, to tell time, handle money. It's more than formulas and equations, which we'll do a lot of in here. It's logic and it's rationality. It's using your mind to solve the biggest mysteries we know and find answers to those mysteries. I, I just love that uh, opening because it's really what data does for us. Good data, I should say, accurate data. Um, and as I just mentioned about journalism, Journalism 101 uh, is telling the truth, not just writing down what somebody said, but confirming if it's true. That's our obligation as journalists. There's an old saying uh, when I was back in journalism school, your mother says she loves you, check it out. Don't take anything for granted. And don't ask dad either because he's not a reliable source. So, <laughs> uh, but it, you know, it's a funny little saying, but it's very true. And it's been very true over the 40 years I've been practicing journalism. Um, and I love this little saying too. If someone says it's raining and another person says it's dry, it's not your job to quote them both. Your job is to look out the window and confirm which one is true. Is it raining or is it not raining? Um, and then it's also your job to tell us who lied about the weather. And it kind of goes back to, you know, a lot of the election stump speeches from, from Trump and from, from Biden. Um, you know, both of them, you know, tell, tell lies, one a little more than the other. Um, and a lot of times the media just would write those down and report what the person said rather than checking out and fact checking and saying, well, this isn't true. This is what Trump or Biden said. Um, which is false. You know, so we need to be able to fact check and, and sh show that that information is, is bad. Um, and, and data can sometimes lie to us. It'll, it'll, it has errors in it. Uh, it is missing data. Um, it even has old data uh, sometimes in it that uh, you know, uh, can misrepresent something. So you know, confirming the data and making sure it's correct is, is, uh, is, is of utmost importance as a data, data journalist. Um, I love this other quote, too. This comes from Melissa Bell, uh, at, uh, who publishes Vox Media, and uh, she's worked with data uh, for years in storytelling. 
uh, what, and she had this at a conference I was at a few years ago. What makes uh, what makes it data journalism isn't the form. The form is the graphic itself. And we'll talk about that a little bit more on Thursday or the map itself. It's the starting point in a data source that we crowd, cleaned, and interpreted. And in just that one sentence fragment, she's described what we do as data journals. You find the data, corral it, download it, scrape it. I'm going to teach you how to do that next week. Clean it, go through and clean it up, edit it, make sure all the data is there, sort it and filter it and interpret it, uh, and find the story in those numbers. That's kind of what that first quote from the TV show Numbers was telling us. So we're going to find data, pull it down, clean it up, interpret it and analyze it, and then we take and build the pretty graphic with it. That's what these next three weeks of this semester are all about. You learn to do the heavy lifting, uh, the crane type lifting with data journalism. And then in week six, we start to do the graphics and, and make it make the data look pretty. That's the fun part. But now we do the heavy lifting. Start with the data, filter it and analyze it, clean it up, visualize it, and then find a way to tell the story. I built this with a little tool called Excaladraw.com. It allows you to fr free sketch uh, uh, little uh, simple little flow charts like this. So data, gather the data, analyze it, filter it, clean it up, take it and do the visual, and then produce the story with it. Because we want to show how to put a face on the data and help, help tell the story of the data rather than just putting up a chart. Go interview somebody that's impacted by the uh, in issue that the data represents, then you have a great package. You have a visual and the story that puts it in context. Kind of like what we're looking at here. Big pile of Legos, messy data. Data's messy, like a big pile of Legos you had as a kid. And oftentimes, you know, we, we sorted the data, maybe sorted all our bricks by color. That's you know, how you sort data. You can arrange it, you know, group it by, you know, different size of the blocks and things like that. Present it visually, maybe as a bar chart like it's done here. But really when it becomes journalism is when you take that visualization, you turn it into a story to provide context. You know, you kind of do that with Legos. You can create a little bar chart with it, but you can also create a little scenario, a little story with it. So that's kind of, through Legos, a simple way of kind of looking at the data journalism process. Here's some other ways to look at it. This comes from IRE, Investigative Reporters and Editors. And I'll talk about this organization quite a bit. I'm a member. I'm a trainer for them at some of their conferences. Um, wonderful organization. Very cheap for students to join. I think it's around 25 bucks. We do these great little graphics that help you better understand data journalism. What data does is it lets you zoom out and see a bigger picture. Okay. So maybe if you've got, oh, my car got towed today in downtown Chicago. How dare the city tow my car? Oh, wait, I parked in front of a no-tow zone. I wonder how many people, other people's cars have been towed. I wonder how many other people's whose cars are like mine, the same year, same make, same color, have been towed in downtown Chicago. How many people, you know, had to pay, haven't paid the fine and left their cars there? We could step out and take that bigger picture and start to count. The city keeps track of towed vehicles. You can find that data set. I'll show you where it is next week. Very easy to find these data, this data, not just in Chicago, but other cities as well. You can take a look at a big picture of an issue. How many people are impacted by an issue? Okay, It allows you to group things together. We'll do this a lot with spreadsheets. You can do it with AI too, which we'll get into a little later this semester. Uh, but you can take all these different types of candy, okay? And you can group them in different ways. And normally, if we were in class, I'd ask you, you know, how, how are some ways we could group these different pieces of candy? Well, you can group them by which candies have chocolate in them on the left and which ones that don't. The Skittles, Starbursts, and Paydays don't have chocolate in them, but the Reese's, oh my God, those are so good. And Snickers do. I'm very much on the left here as far as my candy. Love Snickers, love Reese's. All right. You can also group the candy by those that have whole peanuts in them and those without. Snickers and Payday have whole peanuts. Reese's has ground up, you know, it's like that peanut butter mush that they put in it. So it doesn't really have uh, whole peanuts in it. Uh, and Skittles and, and Starburst sure as heck don't, or they would taste disgusting. But you can group them that way. These are different ways. Same data set, same number of candy bars, but you're just grouping them differently. Or you can group them by the color of the candy. These have orange in them. These don't, even though Reese's packaging is orange. These aren't really orange. These are brown. To group them by color. Different ways of organizing the data can help us tell stories. 
these are some graphics that are actually in one of my textbooks, uh, AI plus uh, the uh, uh, Journalist Toolbox book, uh, which we're not using for this class. These are graphics that Elliot Ramos, who's a data visualization guy over at CBS, has done. And I think they're just brilliant. He uses tacos, which who doesn't love tacos? Um, visualization uh, is about representing simple quantities in simple ways. Like, we'll start with this. How many tacos did I eat yesterday? I had four tacos, but hey, they were small. So they have a little smiley face. Then we group them. Well, not just how many tacos did I eat, but when did I eat them? I ate five on Tuesday and four on Friday. I was really hungry on Tuesday. So you can lay it out as a timeline. Okay. Group them. Okay. What kind of tacos did I have? On Tuesday, I had three beef and two chicken. Friday, I had two beef and two chicken. Okay, so you can start to add, you know, these little categories in here. You can organize things categorically and bucket them not just by day, but by type of taco. How many, when, and then what kind, okay? How many did I eat? You put that on an X and Y axis, and all of a sudden, you've got a little bar chart. This is a horizontal bar chart or a grouped bar chart. You can even group them by the you know, beef and uh, uh, chicken. Um, group bar chart, stacked bar chart. You could say, okay, I had five going vertically, three beef, two chicken. Okay. Then you put it on that X and Y axis, all of a sudden you start to think of it, think of it visually as a graph. Okay. When you have those buckets of time, again, here's my grouped bar charts vertically, grouped, grouped. You'd also stack them. This is what we call stacked bar chart when we have the total quantity, but then that total quantity is broken down by types. How many cars were stolen? Oh, three of the, uh, start, how many cars were stolen, uh, carjacked in Chicago today? Well, three were blue cars, two were red cars. You could group them by color, you could group them by type. Um, three Kias, uh, two Hyundais, you know, because those are popular ones stolen. You know, we've done that data set. So you can think about how you group these together and do a little stacked bar chart with them or a group bar chart where you're just grouping them by type. We'll actually build these types of charts with some data coming up here. We look at hiring processes uh, for both gender and uh, by uh, race uh, for tech companies. We'll actually build that chart uh, in about three weeks. Really cool little chart. Another way to look at the data is to map it. Take that location. You know, Where did I eat them? What, what neighborhood did I eat them in? Was I in Albany Park? You know, was I on uh, in uh, the West Loop? Uh, was I in Lincoln Park? You can map the location. Same data, just a different way of looking at it. So these are the data types we look at. With text, we're looking at something categorically. Uh, that's typically your, your vertical columns. Uh, numerical, anything you can do with math, you can add the columns together, maybe a city budget or something like that. Time and dates are temporal. Um, yeah, those work for timelines, for uh, uh, you know, they can even work in maps. Uh, have a, a, a time lapse map where they appear. You know, each day I ate a taco, it appears on the map. Uh, location, geospatial, that's the mapping. So, a number of different types of data and ways to categorize them to use your to build your, your map or your chart or graph. So these will come up quite a bit, text, numerical, time and dates, and location. And they'll make sense to you when we start to tear apart spreadsheets. And don't panic about the spreadsheets. I walk you through how to do everything with them. You'll find they'll do a lot of heavy lifting for you if you have no uh, experience with uh, spreadsheets. A lot of students are scared of them. I'm like, ah, they're not so bad. They're pretty easy. And then we'll show you some other really cool stuff you can do. Scatter plot charts show relationships. Um, uh, you can determine or not whether two vari variables have the same correlation or not, you know, measuring over that X and Y axis. Scatter plot charts, we don't do a lot of those in here, but we could. Maps and data, you're going to look at points that are along an X, Y axis, longitude and latitude, typically. Um, most data sets have a lat longe or at least a street address uh, that is accurate. Um, if you have bad data and have inaccurate latitude, longitude, or, you know, a street address that... Uh, uh, is inaccurate, you're going to get a bad pinpoint on the map. Sometimes we get that with students. They'll be mapping something in Chicago and they like, wait a minute, why did it map this uh, pinpoint way over in Paris? Uh, it's because the address was wrong. It said Parkway instead of Avenue or it didn't say Chicago, Illinois at the end of the address. 
Uh, so it um, automatically takes it somewhere else and it'll just plot the point somewhere all the way across the world. Um, uh, we can use polygon shapes. Uh, this, this is a shape of Chicago neighborhoods. Uh, we'll work with shape files. It often serves as a nice backdrop to uh, you know, maybe some data that we're plotting, maybe homicide data and the pinpoints are all the homicides. And in the background, you have all the neighborhoods and we can see which neighborhoods have the most and least. So that those polygon shapes uh, in the city of Chicago data portal has them, you know, for neighborhoods, zip codes, all kinds of things, even has like all the L trains and things like that. You just load it into Google Maps and boom, you've got it. Or the other mapping software you'll learn this semester. We'll work with Data Wrapper and others as well. Types of charts. OK, um, you want to look at uh, uh, different uh, types of charts when you load data into your your uh, chart or map making software. Um, and that's a little bit of a challenge early on. And, and usually I wind up helping you out I'm like, oh, no, this is make a good line chart like we have up here on the upper right. Or if it's a budget, no, use a pie chart or a donut chart to break it down or election results, break it down by percentage as a donut chart or a pie chart. Bar chart, you know, good for, uh, you know, uh, measuring things like how many uh, things happened on a certain day, um, you know, time series, date, quantity and categories. That'd be a line chart or a bar chart. Uh, proportions, if there's no time uh, data with it, it's just a city budget or a breakdown of uh, your budget, hire a donut chart would work fine. It's a good, simple, easy way to remember it. And the nice thing about the software I'm going to teach you, Google Flour or Flourish, uh, uh, Flourish Studio and Data Wrapper, uh, if you make a mistake and choose the wrong chart, you don't have to start the graphic over. You can just use a pull down and select a new chart format and it'll change it for you, which is awesome. Why data journals? Well, it adds another layer of credibility to your stories. Instead of just writing a story about a bunch of people saying, hey, there's a, a problem with too much crime in the West Loop, uh, we can actually create a map and uh, a bar chart you show, or line chart showing the increase of crime uh, in the West Loop over the past uh, year or so. Um, or we can map it and show which parts of the West Loop have the most crime, or maybe other neighborhoods nearby have more. Um, it lets you visualize the story for your audience and the data adds credibility to your story. Typically you hit readers in a story with a data point no lower than the third or fourth paragraph. Those two or three key data points you want to get very high in your story because it tells people the scale of the problem, kind of like the forest and the trees that I showed you earlier. It shows how big the problem can be. Okay? But remember, data is not a silver bullet. It's not our answer to all our problems as journalists. Uh, data can be dir dirty, and it's our job to understand it, know where it came from, is it credible, uh, how it got dirty, and how to clean it up, thus the stinky sock. Um, analyzing data can help you answer the what questions, but not always the why questions. Um, it doesn't necessarily replace traditional shoe leather reporting, interviewing people, direct observation. We'll do some of that in this class, as well as the data anal analysis. When you combine the two, you've got a powerhouse story. So if you've got all this, uh, you know, there's data that shows there's an uptick in COVID uh, cases, like there was this spring, I caught it myself, what a joy. Uh, and uh, it, it sh you've got a line chart showing that. You go out and start interviewing people saying, yeah, you know, I caught COVID last spring, but it really was, you know, a pretty uh, uh, mild case. I was coughing for a few days, then I was fine. That provides context to the numbers. So it's not this scary line going up that people are thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die, but it's people telling you, oh, hey, it was a mild case of it. Be wary of it, but maybe it's not the end of the world like it was four years ago. You know, so it provides context to the numbers. That's why the interviews are so important. Your early stories, you won't do a lot of that in here, but later on in the semester, you will. Remember that the story is still about people and how the data impact them, okay? Don't put the num in numbers. Don't drive, drive people crazy with a bunch of data in your stories. Also give context, how it impacts people. Take the numb out of numbers. It's an old saying in data journalism. Some best practices when you're working with data. Always save the original data set and work off of a copy. We're gonna do that a lot this semester. That way if you screw something up and uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you can always go back to your original then. You've not messed up the whole data set. You've still got the original sitting there. Um, never overwrite the original data when you're cleaning it. Always make a copy and work off of the copy. Very, very important in this class. 
How's a spreadsheet structured? We're going to start working with spreadsheets next week where you really start digging into them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, your columns are your are your variables and your rows are the data, the numbers or, or the information that you're, you're measuring. OK, and there's two kinds of uh, uh, variables. There's categorical, uh, such as gender, race, city, postal code type of crime. And then there's numeric, something like an age, a cost, a price on something, population, weight, uh, uh, arrests, accidents, et cetera. Uh, over here, we've got one. Uh, that is mostly categorical. Um, this is data from the city of Chicago data portal. Uh, and it's all the restaurant inspections uh, around the city. And this always makes for a good map. Um, and here you have uh, at the top, uh, you have your first row is all of your categorical labels of what appears in the columns beneath them. So type of inspection, routine food, or a licensing inspection, uh, you know, a, a complaint uh, that came in about it and they're going and checking it out. Uh, it's got the name of the business here, uh, the disposition, um, uh, you know, was the inspection completed, no further action, or was there a warning, or were they shut down? Some of these will say that the restaurant was shut down. I always look at this data set before I ever go eat out someplace new. I like to see even, even places I've gone for years. I want to check and see what their rating is uh, on inspections, who the inspector's name was, and then the observation, you know, what the problem was. Uh, there was a portable fire extinguisher that didn't work or, you know, oh my God, there were rats in the kitchen or, you know, there's some really ugly stuff you'll find over here. Uh, so these rows are the, are the data, even though it's not numbers, it's more categorical. You know, it goes uh, across here by, you know, name of the, uh, or uh, name of the business, what type of inspection it was, who did it, what they found uh, in, you know, what the correction was. Another thing you can do with a data set like this when you start just teaching sorting and filtering, uh, you can see which inspectors were the toughest, which ones issued the most warnings or the most uh, shutdowns, and see which ones were the easiest, uh, which ones just, you know, I'll let it go, you know, uh, a light warning or, uh, you know, didn't, uh, didn't do anything with it, didn't find the issue. It's interesting to look at that. And you can hold these people accountable. Why? Your tax dollars pay their salaries, your city inspectors. They're paid by our tax dollars. Um, always do a four corners check on your data. Once, once you download the data set or scrape it, do a slow scroll through the data. I will start doing this next week. Scroll through it. Work off a copy um, and just make sure all the data is there. Um, check that all the columns and roll, uh, rows are filled out. They're not something missing. Something like an inspection number probably doesn't you know, matter, but you know something like uh, the disposition or the inspector's name or the date, you know, might matter. Okay, so always make sure the data is complete. Uh, work off a copy of the data. And many times spreadsheets have a second tab at the bottom that's called a data dictionary that defines what the, all these labels in the top row mean for each column. You know, what is an inspection number? You know, what is what does inspection date mean? I mean, it kind of makes sense. But, you know, it does have uh, typically a data set will have a little second tab uh, that'll explain uh, a little data dictionary. If it doesn't and you don't understand a column, contact the uh, organization, government agency, or wherever you got that data set from and ask them to explain it to you. It's very important that you understand what all the columns mean. Um, so, uh, you know, these are just some best practices uh, on your data before you actually take and do something with it. Always keep what we call a data diary. This is going to be especially important uh, when you do your uh, uh, final projects, um, because a data diary is just a Google Doc, um, and you keep track of, okay, I downloaded the data set from this site. Uh, I loaded it into Google Sheets, and here's the link. Then I made a copy of it, okay, and here's the link to the copy. Then the, my fourth step was to start to sort the data, or I filtered it and did this with it, or I created a pivot table, or I did some uh, data analysis on it, and here's the formula. Just create a little checklist of what you do each step in case you need to go back and look through it later on. Maybe you need to use the data set again. You have that little diary and that little checklist of what you pulled, where you pulled it from, the copy you made of it, and what you did with it. It becomes especially important with the final project because you'll write Twitter threads, and we'll talk about how to write them, Twitter threads about the project. And you'll tell the reader, you know, here's my first tweet, here's the story and the link to the story, uh, and then you'll reply underneath with these, what's called a Twitter thread, 
Uh, well, if, here's all the steps I use to report it. It's very good for transparency. Uh, you know, here's where I downloaded the data. Here's how I sorted and filtered it. Here's some problems I had with the data. Uh, here's some graphics I made with it. Um, and then, you know, and so on and so on. You typically it's about five or six uh, tweets. Students love doing it. It's probably the last thing you'll do in this class. But having that data diary as you're working makes writing those tweets a breeze. You can do it in just a matter of minutes. So keep a diary as you go along. Just a little Google Doc with all the, uh, with every project, you know, just keep track. But I don't ask you to turn them in, um, but it, it will help you, trust me. Especially if you start making mistakes with it, I can look back through your data diary. It helps me better understand where you made the mistake and can help you. Um, so sometimes I might ask for that. You know, if you're working on something, you say, hey, I screwed up my map. Send me your data diary and your link to your data and your map. Let me take a look. Usually I can answer the question then. So my summer class, I had a student the other day that, uh, I screwed up my map. What do I do? I, I go, I, I don't see a map in front of me. I don't have a data diary. I don't see the data set. I can't help you until I have that information. Um, so keep that in mind. Remember, there are three keys to data journals. You're going to come in with an idea of what the story might be, a hypothesis typically. Okay, I think that there are more carjackings on the rise in Chicago in the last eight months. I'm going to pull the city of Chicago data portal data on carjackings. And I'm either going to prove or disprove my hypothesis with the data. Maybe they're down. Who knows? Um, and, and my hypothesis is disproven, but I've still got a great story. Hey, crime is on the downswing. The KISS method. Keep it simple, sweetheart. You always want to keep things simple. Don't try to overextend yourself and, and create your first Google map with 10,000 plot points. Do something simple, a smaller data set. Keep it simple. The writing you need to keep very simple and straightforward so the readers can understand it. Your maps and graphics need to be able to be simple. The reason is people give you about 10 seconds of their attention, especially on a phone, um, that if they don't understand the graphic in 10 seconds, boom, they're gone. Uh, they might just read the first two paragraphs of your story and boom, they're gone. So by keeping it simple and getting to the point and making it re easy for the reader to understand, you might be able to capture their attention for a little bit longer. Remember the storytelling that data is about more than just numbers, but who's impacted by the data and, and tell their stories, okay? When you're hypothesizing, think about where the data may take you, increases, decreases, outliers. Um, build a list of questions you want answered first before you do the analysis, who, what, when, where, why, how, and how much. And then we're gonna interview the data. We'll do a, this a lot with spreadsheets. We'll even do it with AI a little bit too. We'll ask questions of the data. Okay, well, I've got this data set of bridge inspections in the U.S. and how many state by state, how many uh, bridges are in good condition, fair condition, or poor condition? Well, I'm going to ask a question: of Where does Illinois rank among those 50 states and D.C. Um, uh, as far as uh, the percentage of bridges in fair condition or poor condition? You know, are we good or are we bad in the national? Add fair and poor together and see, does that percentage change and does our ranking change? And we'll be able to you know, ask those basic questions of it. You know, How many types of crimes were there last month in Chicago? How many uh, homicides were there? How many uh, uh, burglaries were there? You know, how many carjackings were there? You know, so on and so on. But ask those questions. Um, keeping it simple, just, you know, most of your assignments in here will just be one or map or one chart. But on your final project, you're going to have two or three, you know. Uh, can a person interpret your chart in 10 seconds? Yeah, I mentioned that. And mostly, you're going to provide context. What does the data mean? What does this chart or this map mean to Chicagoans? Why does it matter? Help data make sense to people. Patrick Mahomes, you may love him, you may hate him. He should have been a bear. Uh, Patrick Mahomes in his 10-year, $503 million contract, you know, they extended him half a billion dollars that Kansas City Chiefs did. Well, what does that mean to us as the average everyday person? Now, I have no idea what half a billion dollars looks like. Well, here's a couple of ways that media outlets help this data make sense. The one on the left is from CBS Sportsline, the one on the right is from ESPN. ESPN broke it down by time. $503 million, even though he makes you know, escalators and bonuses, it averages out to about $50 million a year. I can relate to that a little better. Per day, you know, he's making $137,000 if they broke it down by 365 days over those 10 years. They did the math on this. It's accurate. Every hour 
whether he's playing or sleeping or, you know, hanging out with his family or having a beer, he's making $5,700 an hour per minute. Guy hangs out for a minute, $96 he's making. Every time he takes a breath, it's $1.60. Pretty cool. You know, when you think about it, God, oh my God, it helps the, these numbers down here really help make sense. You know, $5,000, it takes me a while to make that. He makes it in an hour for doing nothing. Um, and here's another way to break it down. They did it by minutes played. Um, uh, so the number of minutes he plays as a player, his average, um, he makes about $49,000 per minute as he's on the field, uh, $83,000 per attempt every time he drops back to pass. So he took a number, his average number of attempts by year and, and averaged it into 503 million over 10 years. Every time he completes a pass, it's worth 126 million. Every touchdown is worth 1.2 million. And every game he's averaging or going to average about $3 million for stepping on the field. Pretty cool. So helps you make sense of that data. Here are the common angles for data stories. Uh, showing scale or change, how big a problem is or, or how much something has changed, has crime gone up or down. Uh, rankings where Chicago ranks among all states as far as bridges in poor condition. Variations showing state to state, maybe how uh, people voted in the election. Um, exploring a database, people can go in and search a database. We're gonna build databases in here. They're very easy to do. Uh, taking a spreadsheet, loading it in some software so people can search and find uh, the data themselves. Um, uh, relationships, you know, scatter plot charts. We're not gonna do a lot of that. We'll do some of it. Venn char Ven charts, uh, you know, uh, Venn grant diagrams, things like that. Um, bad open means, you know, missing data. Maybe the story is, is you know, data that's not well kept or is missing data. Um, and then the plus leads is just kind of, you know, where can you go with it? That's why we have the little squiggly here. Where can you really go with the data that, that maybe you haven't, uh, you know, maybe it doesn't fit into one of these categories. Maybe you're just going to write about the data. That usually happens when you have bad data. Um, a lot of government agencies don't keep data on certain, certain issues. That sometimes is a story. Why isn't the government tracking or an organization tracking this data? Uh, maybe you have to build your own data set. We've done that before in, in some of my advanced data classes. So these are different types of or angles of, of stories you can do with data. It's helpful to know that now heading into, you know, working with spreadsheets and downloading them. Oh, man, you know, I, I just pulled a data set. I could do a scale story with this, a change or a ranking story. Sometimes you can do four or five different stories with one data set, which is really cool. Show your work. Um, this is a, a little chart uh, from the early days of the pandemic. It's a little line chart. Uh, broke down uh, the cases by race uh, in Chicago, March 1st to June uh, 1st of 2020. Note that uh, the orange line, uh, this bright orange line here, were unknown race or ethnicity. A lot of the early record keeping did a poor job of tracking gender, age, uh, and race, you know, key demographics with COVID data. People were just coming in and, and testing positive, and, and that was that. They didn't gather much information on them. Uh, so, you know, you need to acknowledge that in the charts to show that there's some empty data. But notice you attribute where you got the data, source Chicago Department of Public Health, and a link to that data set at the bottom, uh, your credit, your name, and then up here, a headline and the dates in the description up here with a legend. In 10 seconds, you can look at this data set and interpret what it's about, what the title is. Oh, here's where it came from. Here's who created it. And if it doesn't have these, this header, we call this a footer at the bottom and a header at the top. If it doesn't have that information in there or clearly defined chart you know, you're going to lose a reader pretty quickly because they won't understand it. We need to be transparent. That's why we have this link down here at the bottom and who created the chart. Very, very, very important. Okay. Some basic guidelines. Do I need a chart or a map? Is a sentence better? Sometimes you don't always have to visualize data. Sometimes you can just write about it. What type of data do I have? Would it make a better bar chart, pie chart, or map? Um, always remember with pie charts, uh, the, the totals of the numbers should add up to 100%. So if it's a budget or something like that, you're looking at the Chicago Bulls payroll uh, and you want to see how it's broken down by a player who gets the biggest chunk of the pie. It's Zach Levine um, and he's overpaid uh, editorializing here. Um, but, uh, you know, it should always add up to 100 percent. Bar charts and line charts show change over time. Progressions. Um, here's a pie chart that shows a you know, breakdown of a, uh, a, you know, of a of a budget, you know, see what's missing here. Um, the date ranges, uh, you know, uh, are, are kind of kind of missing here. But this is uh, 
you know, a breakdown of uh, a uh, uh, Chicago Department of, of Public Health's uh, uh, breakdown of COVID, uh, not a budget, uh, uh, COVID uh, exposure. Um, you know, it said that people were, you know, most exposed at school, hospitals or clinics, businesses, retails, and bars. And, and the bars and restaurants, when they were closed down, were really complaining about this. They said, hey, we're a very low percentage uh, spreader. Um, you know, almost as many people are getting infected by us as they are at grocery stores, and grocery stores are still open. You know, college was pretty low, and then it shrunk down. But uh, it didn't give me percentages on this of each category. I would like to have seen that. Um, no link to the source data, although it does say it comes from the Illinois Department of Public Health. I want to see the actual raw data. Uh, in date range, it doesn't tell me, you know, what when this was. So it's missing some header and footer information. But it's still a pretty good little pie chart, you know, shows that breakdown. It's very telling in the early days of the pandemic. And like, here's a couple funny ones. You know, this is an accounting one break, breakdown here. Why my car gets bad mileage. <laughs> um, this is just a funny one here. I like the sound it makes when I put my foot to the floor to, you know, to drive fast. Yeah. Uh, you know, just a funny little uh, uh, chart there. This Pac Man one's kind of funny too. Remble, resembles Pac Man, does not resemble Pac Man. Have some fun with these. How time passes in the Midwest, January, February are very long, and then your summer months are very. <laughs> Very slow. This is like like a time uh, pie chart. You know, it's just a silly cartoon. But you know, I thought you might want to see some fun pie charts as well as the serious stuff. Um, bar and chart columns or uh, uh, bar charts uh, compare numerals, percentages, and other data usually over time uh, and or between entities. Um, it could be the increase in campaign contributions to a candidate over a twelve month period, uh, increase in COVID positive tests over a period of time. Uh, line charts show continuous growth uh, over a, a scale, typically time. Uh, could be your monthly unemployment rates, stock market prices going up or down, sports stats, you know, the Bulls, you know, game per game average, you know, going up or down, uh, defensive uh, numbers going up or down. Bar chart would show, you know, a uh, number of uh, rushing yards per game for uh, DeAndre Swift or, uh, you know, whoever uh, – um, Dwayne Swift, I go, yes, it is. I messed up his name. The new Bears running back, whoever the hell it is, um, is <laughs> they've redid their roster. Um, uh, you know, sports stats work really well showing averages over time. Line charts and bar charts are pretty good at that. Line chart and bar charts sometimes are uh, uh, interchangeable for data biz. Um, not always, but sometimes you can do either one. And, and I'll help guide you uh, as you're working with pie charts, bar charts, and line charts. That's what you learn with when we first start out. Um, I'll help guide you through that process of selecting them. Uh, this is a bar chart or, or also known as a column chart, horizontal bar charts as well, line charts to show the progression over time as well. Uh, we won't do a lot of dot plot charts because we don't do a lot of scatter plot charting in here. Always have your X and Y axis labeled here. Your scale is typically uh, vertical for a vertical column chart, horizontal if it's a uh, horizontal bar chart. Uh, and then your categories are here. Okay, It's going to be days, weeks, months, People, you know, whatever. Population, this is a good example of a population chart. Your X axis is the time element, the year. And then the population in millions, always have that scale on here labeled, uh, and it shows it going up. Okay. You look at this chart, this is a bad one because it doesn't really do a good job uh, of uh, explaining um, what company it is, um, no credit at the bottom. But it does show, you know, the sales have gone down in, in 2008. The expenses had gone up steadily that this company was losing money in 2008. That's basically the story that uh, uh, this line chart tells. Um, but it doesn't have a secondary scale on it because it shows quantity, but uh, that's probably for sales. But what are the expenses? It needs a label over here for the uh, for that um, because you can't measure it off of uh, the same scale because one is money, one is sales numbers um, over here. Could be sales dollars, but... Uh, um, it looks like it's sales quantity because it says quantity right here. Um, this is another one where it's labeled properly. Uh, it used a bar chart and line chart. This came from uh, Block Club Chicago. They did some really good uh, flourish graphics. This is We'll use this tool uh, in this class. It shows uh, the number of confirmed cases over time. And then that's left here in the blue line. And total cases uh, is over here uh, with... Uh, the uh, y-axis label over here. So you notice there's two different scales here. Um, one's measuring the yellow, one's measuring the blue. And you have to have both labeled if you're using, you know, the combination bar line chart. 
Same with here. It had no label over here. So that's the problem. Venn diagrams, we don't use an awful lot here. Um, occasionally, we have one with a, a, a final project. Uh, represents uh, uh, logical sets as circles, uh, sometimes triangles, um, and uh, shows how they uh, overlap to show common uh, 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 interests. Uh, the common elements are, are represented by the overlap. So this is the common element here, similar, uh, but A and B are different. Uh, but where they cross is similar. So you might be looking at birds, cats, and dogs, and these are the different combinations when they overlap. More relational, more, more better at showing relations than anything else, relationships. Um, environmental, social, economic, sustainable development when you have all three, but these others are sustainable, but missing some of the key elements uh, of having full sustainable development. So it just shows relationships, okay? A Venn diagram, it's a joke. It's okay to laugh at this. See, I have to mix this in to make it interesting. You can also use images as charts. Uh, we'll use Venn gauge and maybe Canva a little bit in here a little later in the semester. Uh, they did this one with uh, tea bags uh, to show how hot the water is uh, in the amount of time. Uh, and they use this as images. So they used you know, 210 degrees the hottest and it has to cook the longest, three to six minutes for an herbal tea. Um, for black tea, it's less time, so they scaled it a little differently. Uh, same temperature, temperature, and notice they use lighter colors for the cooler temperatures. And one to two minutes were all here, and then tea bags were a little lower for two to three, and three to six. Very clever. Now I pulled this off at Image, or somebody created this chart. Again, it doesn't have a, 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 a label or a, a credit at the bottom. Um, it does have, you know, kind of where it came from over here, but. You know, I want to know where the data came from, who you know, who, who supplied that data. But I thought it was just very clever to do a visual way to do it with uh, the images, you know, which you can do. And Ben Gage Canva allows you to do charts like this. Um, I thought this one was clever too, where they actually took the candies and created the little bar charts with it. Um, you know, M and M's, the mega M and M's, and the mini M and M's. Very clever, fun. It was somebody who's kind of clowning around. So that's all I had. Um, it's kind of a long lecture. The uh, one for Thursday will be a little shorter, but I wanted to make sure you got a good overview on uh, data journalism and what uh, what we're doing with it. Um, so make sure uh, you do the homework, the readings down here, uh, uh, and uh, make sure you're following the Substack and the Twitter accounts and that you have your stuff on the Medium and uh, Twitter uh, page as well, which is under number uh, two here. So we'll see you on the next training video for Thursday. You can watch these uh uh, at any time, uh, you can knock them all out at once if you want have the whole week done. Take care, everybody, and we'll see you next week, uh, September 10th on Tuesday. We will be back in SEO 1200.